It's January the 12th. Let's read the Bible. Friends, welcome back to this year-long journey from Genesis to Revelation in just one year. So glad to have you with us. Just a reminder, one way you can help us is by liking these daily videos. You know, I've talked with you about the rhythm of the algorithm. If you will like this video on Facebook, on YouTube, on Rumble, and also if you will subscribe to the Keep Believing YouTube channel, we now have over 3,800 people. And so we're moving right up toward 4,000. If you have not yet subscribed, it's free. Please go and do it. And a lot of you now are starting to use the Rumble video platform. Just check that out. This is another way to watch these videos. Uh, if you will like the Rumble videos, and if you will uh, subscribe to the Keep Believing channel, in both cases, YouTube and Rumble, they're free, and you'll get an automatic notification every time uh, one of these videos goes live. So, And you can unsubscribe anytime you want. But it's a great help to us. So, you know, last year, we went through the Bible together, and my buddy Ed Lawhon said this at the end of December. He said, we can't thank you enough for this legacy journey. I renewed my Bible bus pass. It's good for the entire year. Well, Ed, you and Sherry, welcome back on the Bible bus. Somebody else, Pam Bauer says, hopping on with my husband for a return trip. I think it's a wonderful thing when you have gone through the Bible uh, one time, now you're going to do it again. And uh, what that really means is these, these videos that I'm doing on the book of Genesis, they replace the ones I did last year. I'm redoing Genesis. I'm redoing the first part of Psalms. And I'm redoing the book of Exodus. But you'll see as we move through the year, um, some of them are from last year. Some of them are going to be redone for this year. It doesn't matter. The point is we're making this journey together. We're in the book of Genesis Glad to have you with us today. We're reading Genesis 35, 36, and 37. In chapter 35, Rachel dies. In chapter 36, we get Esau's family tree. And by the way, a lot of, a lot of names. Uh, chapter 36 is mostly names. Just a reminder, in case you don't know, my philosophy when we come to these with all these strange place names or all these unusual people names, and you'll see it there, the genealogy in chapter 36, I say him loud, I say him fast, and we just keep on moving. So Rachel dies, chapter 35, chapter 36, Esau's family tree. And then chapter 37, uh, Joseph, the beginning of Joseph's story. The hero rises, and by the end of chapter 37, our hero finds himself, well, you'll see, uh, it, th that his story goes bad very quickly. So we pray, Lord, speak to us from these ancient scriptures, whether we're reading them today for the first time or rereading them, it doesn't matter, Lord. Your word is eternally true. Break forth new light for us today from your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Genesis 35. First, back to Bethel. God said to Jacob, get up, go to Bethel and settle there. Build an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his family and all who were with him, get rid of the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your clothes. We must get up and go to Bethel. I will build an altar there to the God who answered me in my day of distress. He has been with me everywhere I have gone. Then they gave Jacob all their foreign gods and their earrings, and Jacob hid them under the oak near Shechem. When they set out, a terror from God came over the cities around them, and they did not pursue Jacob's sons. So Jacob and all who were with him came to Luz, that is Bethel, in the land of Canaan. Jacob built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, that is, the house of God, because it was there that God had revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. Deborah, the one who had nursed and raised Rebekah, died, and was buried under the oak south of Bethel. So Jacob named it Alan Bakuth. God appeared to Jacob again after he returned from Paden Aram, and he blessed him. God said to him, your name is Jacob. You will no longer be named Jacob, but your name will be Israel. So he named him Israel. God said to him, I am God Almighty. 
Be fruitful and multiply. A nation indeed, an assembly of nations will come from you, and kings will descend from you. I will give to you the land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac, and I will give the land to your future descendants. Then God withdrew from him at the place where he had spoken to him. Jacob set, a, set up a marker at the place where he had spoken to him, a stone marker. He poured a drink offering on it and poured oil on it. Jacob named the place where God had spoken with him Bethel. And I say again, Bethel means it is the house of God. Now, keep reading. Verse 16, they set out from Bethel. When they were still some distance from Ephrath, Rachel began to give birth, and her labor was difficult. During her difficult labor, the midwife said to her, Don't be afraid, for you have another son. With her last breath, for she was dying, she named him Ben-Oni, but his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. Jacob set up a marker on her grave. It is the marker at Rachel's grave still today. Israel set out again and pinched it, pitched his tent beyond the Tower of Eder. While Israel was living in that region, Reuben went in and slept with his father's concubine, Bilhah, and Israel heard about it. Jacob had 12 sons. Leah's sons were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. Rachel's sons were Joseph and Benjamin. The sons of Rachel's slave, Bilhah, were Dan and Naphtali. The sons of Leah's slave, Zilpah, were Gad and Asher. These are the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Paden Aram. Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre in Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where, I, where Abraham and Isaac had stayed. Isaac lived 180 years. He took his last breath and died and was gathered to his people old and full of days. His sons Esau and Jacob buried him. So end of chapter 35, Rachel has died and Isaac has died. And the touching moment there, Jacob and Esau clung together to bury their father. Now, chapter 36, Esau's family tree. These are the family records of Esau, that is Edom. Esau took his wives from the Canaanite women, Adah, daughter of Elon the Hethite, Aholibamah, daughter of Anah and granddaughter of Zibion the Hivite, and Basimoth, daughter of Ishmael and sister of Nimbaioth. Adah bore Eliphaz to Esau, Basimoth, bore Ruel, and Aholibama bore Jeush, Jalem, and Korah. These were Esau's sons who were born to him in the land of Canaan. Esau took his wives, sons, daughters, and all the people of his household, as well as his herds, all his livestock, and all his property he had acquired in Canaan. He went to a land away from his brother Jacob, for their possessions were too many for them to live together, and because of their herds, the land where they stayed could not support them. So Esau that is, Edom, lived in the mountains of Seir. These are the family records of Esau, father of the Edomites in the mountains of Seir. These are the names of Esau's sons, Eliphaz, son of Esau's wife, Ada, and Ruel, son of Esau's wife, Basimoth. The sons of Eliphaz were Teman, Omar, Zepho, Gatam, and Kenaz. Timnah, a concubine of Esau's son, Eliphaz, bore Amalek to Eliphaz. These are the sons of Esau's wife, Ada. These are Ruel's sons. Neha, Zerah, Shammah, and Mizah. These are the sons of Esau's wife, Basimah. These are the sons of Esau's wife, Aholibamah, daughter of Anah and granddaughter of Zibion. She bore Jeus, Jalem, and Korah to Edom. These are the chiefs among Esau's sons, the sons of Eliphaz, Esau's firstborn, chief Teman, chief Omar, chief Zepho, chief Kenaz, chief Korah, chief Gatum, and chief Amalek. These are the chiefs descended from Eliphaz in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Ada. These are the sons of Ruel, Esau's son. Chief Nahath, chief Zerah, chief Shammah, chief Mizah. These are the chiefs descended from Ruel in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Esau's wife, Basimoth. These are the sons of Esau's wife, Aholibamah, chief Jeus, chief Jalem, chief Korah. These are the chiefs descended from Esau's wife, Aholibamah, daughter of Anah. These are the sons of Esau, that is Edom, and these are their chiefs. These are the sons of Seir, the Horite, the inhabitants of the land, Lotan, Shobal, Zibion, Anat, Dishon, Ezer, and Dishon. I should say, verse 21, Dishon, Ezer, and Dishan. These are the chiefs among the Horite, the sons of Seir, in the land of Edom. 
The sons of Lotan were Horai and Heman. Timnah was Lotan's sister. These are Shobal's sons, Alvan, Manahath, Ebal, Shepho, and Onim. These are Zimbian's sons, Ai and Anah. This was the Anah who found the hot springs in the wilderness while he was pasturing the donkeys of his father Zibian. These are the children of Anah, Dishan and Holabama, daughter of Anah. These are Dishan's sons, Himdan, Eshban, Ithran, and Chiron. These are Ezra's sons, Bilhan, Zaavan, and Akon. These are Dishan's sons, Uz and Aaron. These are the chiefs among the Horites, Chief Lotan, Chief Shobal, Chief Zibian, and Chief Anah, Chief Dishan, Chief Ezer, and Chief Dishan. These are the chiefs among the Horites, clan by clan, in the land of Seir. These are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the Israelites. Bela, son of Beor, reigned in Edom. The name of his city was Dehaba. When Bela died, Jobab, son of Zerah from Basra, reigned in his place. When Jobab died, Husham from the land of the Temanites reigned in his place. When Husham died, Hadad, son of Bedad, reigned in his place. He defeated Midian in the field of Moab. The name of his city was Avith. When Hadad died, Samla from Masrikah reigned in his place. When Samla died, Shaul from Rehoboth on the Euphrates River reigned in his place. When Shaul died, Baal Hinan, son of Akbor, reigned in his place. When Baal Hinan, son of Akbor, died, Hadar reigned in his place. His city was Paul, and his wife's name was Mihatabal, daughter of Matrid, daughter of Mizahab. These are the names of Esau's chiefs according to their families and their localities by their names. Chief Timnah, Chief Alba, Chief Jethith, Chief Aholibama, Chief Elah, Chief Pinon, Chief Kenas, Chief Teman, Chief Mibzar, Chief Magdiel, and Chief Eram. These are Edom's chiefs according to their settlements and the land they possessed. Esau was father of the Edomites. Now, you might be tempted to say to yourself, that chapter is not very important. But in the unfolding of the biblical story, it's hugely important. We're told a couple of things that Jacob and Esau, they eventually basically got along. But Jacob was a rich man. Esau was a rich man. Flocks and herds and and uh, herdsmen, and, and the, the land wasn't big enough. So Jacob, his people stayed in the land of promise, the promised land. And uh, um, Esau and his men, they moved east and south, east and south of the Dead Sea into the region around Mount Seir, the region just generally called in biblical maps, Edom. And, and what's the point of all this? Well, there was a place in this chapter where it was said there were kings in Edom before there were any kings in Israel. That's the, that's the, and that's the, Moses is telling us something that God had sent. God said back through through Isaac to Esau when Esau was cheated out of the uh, out of the blessing. He had sold his birthright, got cheated out of the blessing. Father, do you not have a blessing from me too? And he gave him a blessing, and you will be great, and great nations will come from you. Here is the proof. Here is the proof. The descendants of Esau grew and became very great. And it even happened, Jacob, Jacob, and then the tribes are going to develop out from him. But first, but first, these kings come out of Edom, just exactly as God had promised to Isaac. So even though Esau got cheated, God blessed him and blessed his descendants greatly. That's I'm stopping here because this is the chapter we would tend to skip over and we shouldn't skip over it. It's, it's proof. God keeps his promises even to those who feel they have been cheated in life. Here we go. Chapter 37, Jacob stayed in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. These are the family records of Jacob. At 17 years of age, Joseph tended sheep with his brothers. The young man was working with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought a bad report about them to their father. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than his other sons because Joseph was a son born to him in his old age, and he made a long sleeve robe for him. Stop here to say you do understand. This is in the King James called the coat of many colors. There's a, there's a debate about how this should be. It's some unusual 
It's some very unusual and beautiful robe. He made a long sleeve robe for him, verse 4. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not bring themselves to speak peaceably to him. Then Joseph had a dream. When he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. There we were binding sheaves of grain in the field. Suddenly my sheaf stood up and your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheep. Are you really going to reign over us? His brothers asked him, are you really going to rule us? So they hated him even more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream. He told it to his brothers. Look, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and 11 stars were bowing down to me. He told his father and brothers and his father rebuked him. What kind of dream is this you have had? He said, am I and your mother and your brothers really going to come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in his mind. His brothers had gone to pasture their father's flocks at Shechem. Israel said to Joseph, your brothers, you know, are pasturing the flocks at Shechem. Get ready. I'm sending you to them. I'm ready, Joseph replied. Then Israel said to him, go and see how your brothers and their flocks are doing and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the Hebron Valley and he went to Shechem. A man found him there wandering in the field and asked him, what are you looking for? I'm looking for my brothers, Joseph said. Can you tell me where they are pasturing their flocks? They've moved on from here, the man said. I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph set out after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him in the distance, and before he had reached them, they plotted to kill him. They said to one another, oh, look, here comes that dream expert. So now, come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of the pits. We can say that a vicious animal ate him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to save him from them. He said, let's not take his life. Reuben also said to them, don't shed blood. Throw him into this pit in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him, intending to rescue him from them and return him to his brother. When Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped off Joseph's robe, the long sleeve robe that he had on. Then they took him and threw him into the pit. The pit was empty without water. They sat down to eat a meal. And when they looked up, there was a car caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were carrying aromatic gum, balsam, and resin going down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what do we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come on, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay a hand on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed when Midianite traders passed by. His brothers pulled Joseph out of the pit and sold him for 20 pieces of silver to the Ishmaelites who took Joseph to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, the boy is gone. What am I going to do? So they took Joseph's robe, slaughtered a male goat, dipped the robe in its blood. They sent the long sleeve robe to their father and said, we found this, examine it. Is it your son's robe or not? His father recognized it. It is my son's robe, he said. A vicious animal has devoured him. Joseph has been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth around his waist, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters tried to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will go down to Sheol to my son mourning, and his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, and the captain of the guards. End of the story for today. So what do you think is going to happen? You know what our problem is with this story? <laughs> and I don't have any way of overcoming this. We know how it ends. We know about Potiphar's wife, and we know about the prison, and we know about Joseph becoming the prime minister and his brothers, that famine down there in the land of Egypt, uh, their famine that spread from Egypt and all over the inhabited world. And we know about that. And we know uh, and our minds go to the end of the story. Genesis 50, 20, when Joseph said to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Let me just say this. At this moment in the story, old Jacob is brokenhearted because he believes on what appears to be good evidence that his own, his beloved son Joseph is dead. He believes Joseph is dead and his brothers have lied to 
and deceive their father, and they're, they deceive their, the, the, the terrible, the terrible thing they did in selling their brother, throwing him in the pit, and they're going to kill him and then sell him into slavery, and the Midianites sell him down there on, on the slave market in Egypt. But they don't know about that. As far as they know, he's just gone. He's never coming back. He's probably going to die down there in Egypt somewhere. This story is just an awful mess at this point. Just remember this. God knows what he's doing, even when you and I, we don't have a clue. It, this, it's not as if Joseph, though he was a dreamer, it's not as if God has said, well, you're going to be Potiphar's wife in the prison and the cupbearer in the bank. He didn't know. How much did Joseph? He didn't know anything. All he knows is my brothers, my brothers sold me. They sold me into slavery. And I've been purchased by this guy, Potiphar. And he doesn't know anything else. As far as he knows, he's stuck in Egypt and he'll never see his family again. Uh, it's okay if today your life makes no sense to you. It's okay. I think I've told you this before, but if not, I'll tell you for the first time. Just because your life is messy doesn't mean God has messed up your life. God was with Joseph when he sent him those dreams. God was with Joseph. You know, there's a little, just a little, little detail in this story, a little tiny detail. His father says, go find your brothers. They're up around Shechem. He goes to Shechem and they're not there. They've gone to Joseph. They've gone to Dothan, but Joseph doesn't know. And meanwhile, some guy just shows up. Some random dude is out in the field, and Joseph runs into the random dude. Oh, by the way, have you seen my brothers? Yeah, I heard them talking. They're going down to Dothan. Random dude shows up and disappears at just the right moment. Random dude shows up, and then he disappears. Could he have been an angel sent from heaven? Why not? I mean, it, per, even so, just, if you just some truly, just some random dude, it doesn't matter. He was there by God's appointment. It's a sign in the story that God is at work. He's at work. Uh, I found this little, this old gospel song by Charles A. Tinley. Used to sing it, sometimes we still do. Trials dark on every hand, and we cannot understand all the ways that God would lead us to that blessed promised land but he'll guide us with his eye and we'll follow till we die. We'll understand it better by and by. And the chorus goes, by and by, when the morning comes, when the saints of God are gathered home, we will tell the story of how we've overcome. We will understand it better by and by. Don't worry, friends. You don't understand everything now. Some things you'll understand better tomorrow, some the day after tomorrow, and a whole bunch of stuff that happens will not make sense until we finally get to heaven, and we will understand it better by and by. God has Joseph right where he wants him. He's got you today right where he wants you. Go out, friends. Live confidently, confidently. You are where you are by the grace of God. Let's go out and enjoy this day and leave everything else in God's hands. Come back tomorrow. There's more to come in the story of Joseph. See you then. God bless.